Hi, welcome to Coffee and Conversation. I'm your host, Karim Rafa. I'm joined today by Samir Raf, founder and CEO of Bluefire AI. Thank you so much, Samir, for coming today, taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. I really look forward to this. Before we get into the nitty gritty of everything, can you tell me a bit more about what you're doing at Bluefire AI and how you came up to it? Yeah, so Bluefire AI, we're um, sort of algorithmic investment intelligence. So we look at, look at uh, a lot of companies all around the world, so whether it's American, Japanese, Chinese, and uh, we try to distill out what's really the state of truth around that company. A lot of companies might tell you what they say they're doing. They may or may not be doing what they say they're doing. And sometimes, even if you figure out that truth, that may not be interpreted very well by the global investment community. So we try to bridge that gap. We try to find any time where the reality, the perception, and the actuals of a company are not really in sync. So you did mention AI, and it's in your name as well. Can you yes. tell me how the tech plays a role in distilling the truth? Uh, absolutely. This is a great question. So maybe we take a, we take a step back and think about why is AI really relevant in, the, in, the, in this context. At the end of the day, companies are legal structures that control a fair amount of capital, a fair amount of human and other resources, and they have linkages to different parts of the supply chain, and all this moves. As all these moves, the final output of that company is a cash flow. It either makes profit or it doesn't. What investors are trying to determine all the time is which companies are going to generate more cash flow and what, hence, who should they allocate more capital. Traditionally, to do this for the last 30 years, we've been using very expensive humans, if you might. So on the sell side, which are investment banks, that can cost almost up to $750,000. And on the buy side, that can cost more than a million. That's not just their wages, it's their full cost. As a result of this, because it's so expensive and so few people that are available, we're not able to do justice to every company around the world. We, we focus on very few firms. The stock listed ones, the bigger ones. Right. And not only the listed ones, what would be surprising to know is when you look at all the assets we have, so let's say $60 trillion in the world today, which are managed more or less in an active manner between equities and credit, a lot of it is concentrated in the top 3,000 companies in the world. Once you're listed, every company discloses almost at the same standard. And you have all that information available. And given a new age of technology and information, you have both formal professional press covering a lot of these firms, as well as a lot of informal social media and events-driven reporting. So you have a lot of information out there. If anything, you have too much information. It's almost death by information. So where, where you have, um, if you look at a company like Tesla, you're going to have 60 or 70 analysts looking at that firm. You take any random uh, mid-cap in Indonesia, you'd be lucky if you had two guys looking at the company. So as a result of which, it doesn't get access to capital that easily. So what we're trying to solve, we can't really go and you know, give birth to another 30,000 really high quality analysts. So we're creating algorithmic intelligence that can really scale and that can go down and find out what's the truth about all these companies that are more smaller in size or mid caps or in emerging markets where you don't have that human talent pool and hence supplement the information that the industry today processes. Can you tell me more about, it's, not, it's more than just AI, it's NLP to some extent. I understand that Blue Fire also has a Mandarin NLP, which are very rare in the industry. Yeah, so NLP or natural language processing is a subtask within artificial intelligence and it largely deals with the ability to read and understand a language, like a native speaker. Now, we do possess today, this may not stay true five years later, but we do possess the most accurate Mandarin natural language processing pipeline in the world. Now, why would an investment intelligence company go and do this? Um, that's the key question to answer first. So when we looked at the English world or the U European languages, we inherited a lot of good technology from people like Google, Microsoft Research, they've done this job. When we looked at Mandarin, unfortunately, even the best of universities and people like Baidu Research or Alibaba, the accuracy rates are so low. When you're doing investments, you can't read an article, understand the 60% of what is said, and then draw conclusions. You become wrong. So we ended up building a massive uh, R&D team right here in Singapore. And it was staffed with uh, a lot of top scientists that we got from China, from Cambridge, Germany, and the US. And we ended up building one of the most sophisticated natural language processing pipelines. So it enables us to read Mandarin. Um, we're at a once in a generation event. The last time this happened was in 1980s, when Japan, as a new emerging power, integrated into global markets. 
we're seeing the exact same thing play out with uh, China right now. Now, unfortunately, in China's case, what has happened? If you look at the last uh, 30, 40 years of its growth, it's been a central uh, driven growth, like central decision making. So the government made choices on which industry to grow, which industries to not grow. And then those policies, those five year plans and those policies were largely implemented by state owned banks giving loans to state owned companies. All nice and good while China was playing catch up. What a lot of people don't realize today is China's gone past that now. China creates and innovates at a speed that majority of people in the West do not comprehend. But that creates its own challenges. Imagine the kind of technology, the innovation, new business model coming out in China. How is a bureaucrat who sat in a state-owned bank going to ever, you know, be able to judge how much capital they should give to it? What's the risk of that investment? So Chinese government decided, right, we can't do this anymore through bank loans. We've got to open up our capital markets. We've got to strengthen our equity markets and debt markets. They go down that path. That's relatively new. Stock markets really clicked back in uh, about 15 years ago. And it's only in the last four to five years that beyond that, they have started providing information which is more truthful, more legitimate, and you actually see negative news, a lot of negative news on Chinese companies. So you fast forward to today, you have pretty high quality disclosures, not yet at an American or a German standard, but very high quality by the Chinese historical standard, shaping up, the government pushing it in the right direction. However, we do not have enough people. If China needs 10,000 high quality investment professionals, high quality being the key word, it probably has 300 to 400. There's a huge deficit and the markets are very immature. So what we're trying to do is find all the information in Mandarin that is not yet acted upon by the market, interpret that, and then provide that in a way to the investment community that does not speak Mandarin. So they can actually trade on the back of that. So hence Mandarin. So beyond turning NLP and just taking qualitative information, turning it into quantitative, actionable information, you're actually taking information that cannot be written quanti quantified by the majority of the world yes. and turning it into actionable triggers. Pretty much, yes. And th there are insights out of that. It can be as raw data. And there's all sorts of interesting cases. One interesting case is um, Chinese pharma now is a big deal, for example. right? The, I can't remember exactly when, but I think sometime last year, uh, a homegrown Chinese manufacturer got the first FDA approval for a drug to be sold globally and especially in the United States. Now, when you look at this, it's like a F1 race. You know, you've got cars along different stages of trials. How do you know which company is going to crack this market and which drug is going to succeed? Knowing that requires forensic analysis uh, in identifying the leaders in, in solving diabetes and solving tuberculosis. In the West, People employ thousands of people to figure this out. In China, you don't have that workforce. It just doesn't exist. If Blue Fire becomes a conduit of quality capital to companies that really need it, I believe a lot of quality companies will voluntarily report this because they'll get access to more patient, more stable, more longer-term capital rather than just be exposed to, you know, people just searching some slight mispricings in today, out tomorrow. These are people who believe in your business. So following that, I'm confident we can convince some of the governments, especially in emerging markets, to lay, lay down this pathway for how companies can really differentiate themselves as higher quality to what people normally perceive them. So it's one step further on the same journey. Fantastic. Very exciting times. Absolutely. Well, Sanir, thank you so much for joining us today. Very excited to see where we're going to take this. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.